all of the spiritual blessings that he has for us, as, as you see on the slide here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. When we remember what he's done for us and what he calls us saints, and he tells us, regardless of how we feel, that we are chosen in him. And we've been chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. When we remember all that he's done for us and what he says about us, there's only one response that is appropriate. And that is what the song says. Go back and do the things you used to do. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent. And so today as we bring the Lord's Supper into this preaching through Ephesians, I hope that you'll consider repentance. Is there anything in your life that needs to change? And you have the entire service to think about it as we're examining ourselves in light of God's word. Now, the first, second, third chapter is really about the doctrine of Christ, the teaching of who we are in Christ, what Christ has done for us, and the position that he has put us into. We are raised in him forever and ever and ever. But now starting with this fourth chapter, there's a word here, therefore. In light of everything in chapter one, two, and three, therefore, we go from doctrine to duty or from position into practice. Something practical. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, the prisoner for the Lord, Paul, he says, in light of all this, I who has who have surrendered all that I am and all that I have to the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. So I think before we go any further, we've got to think about Paul. Was he walking worthy of the calling he had received? Well, as a prisoner for the Lord, uh, whether free or in chains, whether well fed or hungry, plenty or in want, he lived quite transparently in front of us. And so he prefaces this idea of walking worthy of the calling, he prefaces it with his own. Now, I put up here this word baptism, thinking about who we are in Christ. We were called like Paul on the road to Damascus, called individually. He called us by name and those of us who responded, he said, here I am, Lord. Take my life. I surrender all to you. And then the first initial step of obedience for the Christian is usually <laughs> baptism by immersion. When you call out on his name and he saves you, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. He changes you. He washes you from the inside out. And he calls you his own. And he, he raises you uh, to heavenly places. That's your position in Christ. But now our practice of obedience to the Lord through baptism is to go down into the waters of baptism. And it is symbolic, just like the Lord's Supper. Uh, Joanne, can you come on up here for a moment? Okay. And Carol, why don't you come on up with her? These two were roommates. Are you still roommates? Yeah, roommates. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell on it a little bit. I think that when Joanne came into Carol's life, she was a bit of a thorn in Carol's flesh because she was keeping her awake at night. Isn't that right? Yes. It's yeah. True. <laughs> she was kind of problematic. And still is. Still is sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what um, Carol did was she continually prayed for Joanne. And she prayed for her, prayed for her, and had others praying for her. And she prayed for herself and her own response. And Joanne got to, through Carol's discipleship, Joanne got to ask Jesus to be her Savior. Is that right? Yeah. Amen. 
Matter of fact, I have had the said the Lord prayer with her. I sang into my heart with her, and she said, "I want to be in heaven." So, did you pray to ask Jesus to be your savior? Yes. We both said, "Nail them beside my bed and pray to you." <laughs> And so now it's your desire for something special to happen at church to tell everybody that you got saved. What is it that you want to have happen next? Good life. I'm going to baptize for, for a while. <laughs> so she's been wanting to be baptized. So we're going to do that as a church. All right. Okay, God bless you guys. Kyla and Ben, will you um, bring up a little five-year-old that's been entrusted to you? See, uh, Joanne was just thrust upon Carol as, here's your new roommate. But in similar fashion, God just brings some people into our lives. And uh, who wants to speak for this family? What's happening? She was there. She came up to me. I was in bed, um, probably pretty grumpy, but she came up to me and sat right next to me. First things first, she's like, Mom, I want Jesus in my life. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. So I'm like, right now? <laughs> you know. So we prayed, and she accepted Jesus in her heart, and she's very proud of it. She told Pastor Rob. She makes sure to tell everybody, and she faithfully prays for a guy named Eric um, and Paloma, and faithfully prays for um, her her uh, brother. So yesterday, Annabelle was trying to scare her. She said, "No, I don't have to be scared. I'm a Christian now, but you have to be scared because you're not a Christian yet." So she understands some of it. It's pretty cool. She she, she asked a lot of questions. So that what happens when a person uh, asks Jesus to be the Lord and Savior. If it's at all possible, we encourage baptism by immersion. So we'll let the parents talk about that. And, and certainly when it's Emma's time, um, anybody in the family that wants to go into the waters of baptism as our representative would, would baptize Emma. Emma, we are so happy that you have asked Jesus to be your Savior. God bless you. Go ahead and be seated. So baptism is something that um, if you died after you asked Jesus to be your Savior, if you died and you did get baptized, there really wouldn't be a big deal. You'd still go to heaven. But what it does for us, it's a one-time event that should stick with us the rest of our lives. And it really should be at the height of our joy, our passion. When you go down into the waters of baptism, we say something like this. We're, we've died with Christ. But then we come up out of the water and we say, as Christ rose from the dead, so are we also raised to walk in newness of life. Paul says, walk worthy of the calling you have received. That one time excitement when you've invited your friends and your family and the whole church gets excited. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Somebody got saved. They go down in the waters of baptism. That's how the family spreads. We're all joyous. But then, the rest of our lives, we have this opportunity to take of the bread, another symbol and ordinance of the church. And that's when we have to ask ourselves, do I still have as much joy and passion for the Lord back as I did when I first got saved? And if not, well, there's things we can do about that. So we gather together and listen to what Paul told us. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At the first service today, we had some people I didn't know. And so I, didn't, I wanted to make clear that this is for Christians. But if you have, A, admitted that you're a, uh, a sinner, if you've admitted that you're a sinner, and B, if you have believed that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin and you receive him as your Lord and Savior, you can confess him openly today. You can take of the bread and drink of the cup and you can say, yes, I'm a Christian. This is one of the ways that we proclaim 
that Jesus died to pay for sin. And we do this because we're Christians. Sometimes it's our kids that are watching the parents or the grandparents eating of the bread and cup. And hopefully the preacher or Sunday school teacher would say, if you're not a Christian, don't take it because everybody else is taking it. Let it go by and then deal with why didn't you receive God's gift yet? Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So I think this fits well when we're thinking about walking worthy because we want to approach the Lord's table in a worthy manner. What can I do? A man should examine himself in this way. He should eat the bread and drink from the cup. One of the ways I can walk worthy is to examine myself regularly. Well, my daughter called me this week and said, Daddy, could you take my car in for an oil change? And it reminded me back when she was just a little girl when I was checking the oil in the family car. And she says, Daddy, what's that? When I pulled out that thing, and I didn't say it's a dipstick. She said, Daddy, what's that? And I go, oh, well, this tells me if there's enough oil in the car. And she said, it can talk. It reminded me that sometimes we take things very literally. And so I had to speak to her in a language she could understand. Now, I don't know a whole lot about cars, but I know that this marker, I don't draw with it, but it does tell me something, and it doesn't speak to me. There's a way that I can look at this, and I can know, one, whether my oil is dirty. If it's really, really dirty, then it probably hasn't been changed in a long time. There hasn't been any repentance in a long time if it's filthy dirty. And if it's low, it probably hasn't been checked. There's been no examination. But I'm not there hopeless. No matter what it says, no matter what the marker shows, whether it's dirty or whether it's low, there's something I can do. Paul says, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness. So I have to examine myself. Is my walk with the Lord, is it a humble walk? What's the opposite of humility? Pride. Now pride gets in our way. God opposes the proud, but he exalts and he gives grace to the humble. How do we know when pride is a, a priority in our life. It might be different for each one of us, but if you know the difference, if there's pride in your life right now that's keeping you from being transparent, it's putting your self in opposition against God's best for you, here's something you can do. You look at the dipstick of your life. It's dirty. If pride has been running your life, Something about pride has been getting in the way. Well, it's dirty. You can change it. Gentleness. What's the opposite of gentleness? Well, I'm just going to say aggression. And, you know, there's a gentle response to life circumstances. And then there's an aggressive, um, discontented response that we ought to be able to tell the difference. Clean, full, or empty Lacking and dirty. Walk with all humility and gentleness. Well, I think there's a passage of God's word that can really help me. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. All you who have gotten dirty, all you who are lacking, come to me and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me. 
because I am gentle and humble in heart. If I'll take the yoke of the Lord Jesus upon me afresh, I'll be like him. I'll be humble like him. I'll be gentle like him. But I won't just be imitating him. If I take up his yoke and learn from him afresh on this first Sunday of August, I'll learn from him. He lives in me. I live in him. I will exemplify. I will let Christ live through me. I will be gentle and humble in heart, and I'll find rest for my weary, burdened soul because Jesus promises his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Paul said, walk worthy of the calling you've received with patience. I went up to Gary Avery today. He was sitting next to his wife while she was talking. It was after church. I said, boy, Gary, you sure look contented and at peace. It seems like I see you waiting on her, and I don't think I've ever seen her waiting on you in this, you know, where somebody's talking and there, there's another person in the connection ready to go. And he laughed. I said, well, I'm going to be speaking about patience in the next service. And he said, we talked about patience this morning. Patience. In light of the Lord's Supper. In this first service, I read through Paul's passage and he said he had a problem with the church and the way they were doing the Lord's Supper in Corinth. It was part of a meal, and some were pushing ahead of others and eating more than their fill and drinking more than they ought. They'd forgotten that this is the Lord's table. They were pushing and shoving. And so Paul said, when you come together, you should wait upon one another. Patience. Today, we're going to come forward for the Lord's Supper. Instead of passing to the believers, we're going to ask the believers to come forward. And I would ask that we allow the older ones to come first. Sometimes in the potluck line, the kids and the teenagers might run to the table first because they haven't developed manners. But we're going to wait upon the older ones. I'm going to ask those uh, when we come to this point. If you're 80, 80 years old or older, to come to the table first. Kurt's 81 years old, and he's going to be serving with me. And each person that comes forward will be coming as a sign. I've asked Jesus to be my Savior, and I want to return to my first love. I want to receive Jesus invitation to come to him and to put his yoke on again and to remember that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Paul said, walk worthy, accepting one another in love. I'm thankful for Carol's testimony. She had this new roommate. She was excited about a new roommate, but there was a change in her life that she didn't invite. It wasn't something she chose to do. It was chosen for her, and it involved another living being. It wasn't just uh, some misfortune that happened upon her. It was a person, and we probably all have people in our lives that rub us the wrong way sometimes. When... Paul tells us, walk worthy of this high calling. It involves other people. We're called to one another. Maybe I rub you the wrong way, and maybe, just maybe, sometimes you get on my nerves, whether I tell you about it or not. Maybe just something that happened just kind of rubs me the wrong way. And by coming to the house of the Lord today and gathering together with you, I can say, hey, it's not about me. I might be wrong. 
maybe pride, aggression, the opposite of what Christ has for me. Maybe that has risen to the top. So the word says, accept one another in love. I have to ask myself, Lord, do you love this person? And the answer is always going to come back, yes. Well then, Lord, will you give me your love for this person? See, I italicized this participle. Accepting. It's a process. You can say, oh, I accept you in love. Well, maybe tomorrow you're going to have that checked one more time. Maybe the person you're married to, maybe your kids, your grandkids might be a neighbor. In the church, though, we learn how to deal with our neighbors in love. Walk worthy of the calling you've received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. That's a mouthful. I want to look at unity first of all. So what is unity? Well, it's a, it's a cohesion. And it involves a variety of members that are bound together. So we had a, a couple from our special ministries class. And we know that they're going to go to camp next week. And a number of people in the church are going to go to camp next week. And we're going to make the camp all about priority. Loving on these people by name. Getting to know them and listening to their cares and their concerns and not separating separating ourselves off from them as though we're maybe better than them no they are equal with everybody here and we should be willing to kneel and wash one another's feet whether somebody has more money than us or less money more education or less whether they're as uh, attractive in the terms of the world or less wash one another's feet diligently keep the unity of the spirit so I'm thinking about the Holy Spirit who lives inside Joanne Carol and this little five-year-old that came up with her mommy and daddy there's a spirit that connects them together as well the 80 year old The 20 year old. There is one body and one spirit. Sometimes I forget that. We pray at a guitar circle on Wednesday nights. And I ask the people, pray for the person to the right of you. And so we pray for the one that's right there with us. And we get around through that circle, and there's, there's been a circle, and there's been a lot of prayer, and we've heard others pray for others, and, and we sometimes reverse the order, and we're sometimes sitting in, in a position different than we did last week when we pray, but it tends to be the same people. But this group of people that have gathered for the guitar circle midweek, they also represent the youth group, the Genesis class, the special ministries class, Tim's class, the people that maybe we never see who are in the nursery, can't really tell you who's working in the nursery. And then about the church across town. I don't mean any and every uh, group that says we're the church of Jesus Christ. Some aren't. But the ones who believe like we do. That Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of mankind. And all those who received him, who believed in his name, they became the children of God through our brothers and our sisters. We take part in the worldwide church, the universal church, that was and that is, and even that is yet to come. There's one body, that's the church, and one spirit. He's the one who 
signifies that we are the church. Just as you were called to one hope at your calling, what is that hope? I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I think I heard Carol mention that that was part of the gospel that was shared with Joanne. I get to go to heaven when I die. One Lord, Jesus. He really is the answer. Jesus. There is no other name by which we can be saved. Only the name of Jesus. God who became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus. One day, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. There's one faith. It's what we teach. And we try to teach it consistently. I don't have to wonder if, if there's a different faith being taught in this classroom or in that first service or in that classroom over there or that one over there or even in the nursery. There's one Lord, Jesus, and one faith. What we teach in Vacation Bible School ought to be consistent with the deepest teaching that the seniors are discussing from that epistle of Peter. There's one baptism. At Vacation Bible School, a young man came up to me and said, I was baptized when I was a little guy, but I'm, I'm just wondering, do I need to get baptized again? And I shared with him, what's appropriate is to rededicate your life. If you were baptized and you meant it, you weren't doing it just because of peer pressure. You weren't doing it just because uh, for some reason other than authentic belief. Then that's, that's your baptism. But it's always appropriate to say, Lord, I want to rededicate my life to you today. That's very meaningful for us. One God and Father of all who is above all. Walking worthy of this high calling is to acknowledge that God reigns. He reigns. And so when we're heavy burdened, we're anxious, the cares and concerns of this world are seeking to choke out the joy that we have in the Lord. We've got to remember that nowhere in the scripture does God say, be discouraged. It's always, be of good courage. Be encouraged. If you are discouraged, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. The thief comes only to steal from you, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all. Here's this ministry we can have to one another. I encourage the saints in that first service that we are gathered together today to minister to one another. So it might involve putting your hand on somebody's shoulder and just asking, hey, how are you doing today? And encouraging. I mean, I could do it today. Lay my hand on that guy playing the piano. Man, it sounds nice today. I'm enjoying your voice. I'm enjoying the songs you picked. I know that you had some uh, change in circumstances at the very end. It didn't get to be what you wanted it to, to be, what you had planned on it to be, but it turned out good. I could lay my hand on the bass player's shoulder and say, I really enjoyed hearing you today. I could hear you loud and clear. I just loved that descending bass note in that song. Oh, I loved it. I wanted to hear it there, and I heard it there. It was so pretty. And then her husband playing drums. Always such a joy and encouragement to me. Lay my hand on his shoulder. Thank you for serving the Lord. I could come over to Christy. Christy, you got teenagers in the house right now. I feel for you. <laughs> it was easier back when they were all just real little guys. But when they get older, it's tough. But be of good cheer, because they do grow up. And you're doing a good job. You're loving your husband, you're respecting your husband. 
So don't worry about the future. Serve the Lord. Keep on keeping on. Raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Pray for them. Trust God, who is above all, who's working through each one of us. Trust him. He's in all of us. So let's not be selfish with what he has for us. He's in us. You might have a song. You might have a prayer that he wants to be voiced. He wants to have it voiced through you. A word of encouragement. Walk worthy of this God and Father of all. Now, um, Kathy's going to come and play flute. And Patrice is going to play piano. But I've seen she's gone out probably working with the special folks. Because some of them, they told me, we're going to have to leave at 1130. Um, so I think that they've ducked out. And she's probably trying to take care of them. Kirk, could you ask Patrice to come? The invitation is going out to all. This is my body, which is for you. I know that Jesus, when he prayed this uh, over this bread, he broke it. He said, take, eat, all of you. That was to his disciples there, the ones who said, here I am, Lord, I want to follow you. He said, take, eat, all of you. This is my body. And then likewise, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. So today we'll do things a little differently than we sometimes do when we pass the bread and the cup. We're going to ask the, those that are 80 and older to come first. But we'll wait until uh, Kurt and Patrice are in the room.